Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 20, titled Too Much Too Late. The penultimate. I'm going to use that word a bunch because I, I really love that word. It makes me sound fancy. Put my, <laughs> put my pinky up when I say it. The penultimate episode of Season 5 and all of Miami Vice. Now, I'm going to say I am so happy that we watched it in this order. And I'll get deeper into that in our final thoughts. But this should be Episode 20 and Free Fall should be Episode 21. Or this should be episode 16, and then Free Fall was episode 17. This is the natural place for this. I want to get too long into that. We'll talk about that later. I'm glad you're taking a while to explain it, because I had to look up what penultimate or whatever (laughs) actually meant. It originally premiered on January 25th, 1990. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a second to explain a little bit about this episode. This episode never aired on NBC or USA. At the time, it was considered to be too risque for TV, and they didn't air it at all. It didn't air again until the reruns started, and that's why it shows up in January 25th, 1990, and then it's like one of the most highly praised episodes of Miami Vice ever. This episode shows up every week on Law & Order SVU. (laughs) That's what the whole whole SVU is about. Same episode every week. (laughs) (laughs) Another point on why it's good to be watched in this episode, because in reruns, this one comes on before Freefall. So when the show originally came out, it's a lost episode, never actually aired. And then a year later in reruns, it does. But in reruns, this one comes on before Freefall. Like it should be. (laughs) Yeah, and and it makes the way the characters, with what's going on with the characters in this episode, I think it better sets up Freefall. At least it would seem. I don't know, we haven't watched Freefall yet. I could be completely wrong. There's some more hints here as far as like this is the right order. It is written by John Connor. He never wrote anything else except for this episode, not just for Vice, but forever, <laughs> because the T-1000 was busy chasing him down. <laughs> he, he, he's just always on the run. <laughs> he couldn't write any more TV shows. It is directed by Richard Compton, who also directed Down for the Count Part 1 and 2, which is interesting because he's going to like circle back around on the Zito storyline here it's not the snow globes aren't a zito thing necessarily i mean no they are oh that's right that's, it what, I, is. that's what i was telling you he gave them those okay. uh-huh. yeah that's right that's what it was yeah. that's how we got him i was like drawing a total blank and how we got him but so he does circle all the way back around on the zito storyline here and he also directed everybody's in showbiz the big thaw mirror image just to name a few he's got more than that that he directed He was put into this spot on purpose. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do something with this. (laughs) Now, before we get started on this episode, normally we check in with what's happening in our lives, but just going to set the stage here for how this Go With The Heat podcast is going to end. We are talking about too much too late today. Next week, we are going to have a special free fall episode that's going to be like a um, a primer for free fall because we're that excited for it. So there'll be a primer episode for free fall because it is so huge. We got to break it up into two episodes. That'll happen next week. It's also a very long episode. Yes. It's it's incredibly important because it's the last episode of Miami Vice and like the second to last episode to go with the heat <laughs> because we're going to do free fall. And then, one, then the following week, we'll do our, our normal season five recap with our clip show. And then after that will be our go with the heat and Miami Vice total review of all seasons and where we stand with Miami Vice. And just letting it all air it out now that me and John have seen it all the way through. And Melissa has seen it through for like the 19th time or whatever. <laughs> she can finally get some stuff off her chest. <laughs> and then that's going to be and, it. And then after that, a change of format. And we'll probably be in the adult contemporary station. <laughs> <laughs> and then that'll be it for the podcast, too. We'll be officially retiring the podcast at the end of that whole show recap that will happen in four weeks. So in a month. That'll be our final episode. Next four episodes are the this one plus three more are our last episodes ever to come out. Now, if Miami Vice does do a reboot, we will be back for the reboot. I'm scared of it because I don't know who's going to be in Good it. Good or bad. <laughs> Good Ugly or bad. Or bad. <laughs> we'll be back for it. I don't know for how long, <laughs> but we will be back for our Miami Sorry, Vice reboot. Scott otherwise, Con- we are retired. <laughs> but otherwise, we are retired after these episodes these last couple episodes we'd love for you to stick around and finish off the show with us and get to these final couple episodes we'd love to hear from you in 
what you think about these final episodes, that email, go with the at gmail.com. And uh, we'd love to talk with you before this show comes to an official end, even if it's just a thank you note or I wish you guys would have done it this way or wh whatever it is. We would love to hear from you before we officially retire. But before we get there, let's go talk about Too Much Too Late because this is an amazing episode. Easily, uh, I might say the best episode of season five. Now, I know there's some amnesia shows that were in here, but uh, just saying, let's go break this one down. All right, John, this week we got some new music and i am pumped to hear about them because one of them i am a huge fan me too i am a huge fan of tim truman and phil perry just like you are <laughs> no no but let's start there let's start with tim truman and phil perry's help me through the night and i want to start here because this we talked about it before the season that when to tim truman took over with the music that he made several songs for the show that were just supposed to be kind of like popular rock songs to try and save money rather than just going out and getting Phil Collins every time. <laughs> hey, he costs a lot of money, Phil Collins. He's expensive. This is his last Made for Vice song. In true fashion, it was never released outside of Vice on anything except a bootleg soundtrack. I want that soundtrack. Now, Phil Perry, who is the singer in the song, he's quite famous. He was an R&B singer, songwriter, and musician. He was an original member of the soul group The Montclairs from 71 to 75. He'd record a couple albums with the Montclairs. The Montclairs would break up in 1975. Phil Perry would move to California with one of his other fellow members, Kevin Sandlin. They would put out two albums as a duo, but only the song Just To Make You Happy would get any kind of radio play. Going into the 90s, he would cover Call Me, which was an Aretha Franklin hit. It would be his first number one, and it would lead to top 40 hits, Amazing Love and Forever. Also on his first solo record, he's released more than 10 al solo albums, as well as being a primary vocalist on the number of big-name jazz artist recordings. Some of his songs have appeared on soundchecks for some pretty big movies like Roots, Pretty in Pink, Short Circuit, and Captain Ron. Our next artist is Mink DeVille with the song Mixed Up, Shook Up Girl. Mink DeVille is a rock band known for its association with early punk rock bands. They were a feature band at New York's famous CBGB nightclub and are known for being a showcase for the music of Willie DeVille. All in all, the band recorded six albums, but except for frontman Willie DeVille, the original band members only played on the first two albums. The remaining albums, Willie would assemble musicians, and then in 85, he would start bringing in backup bands and would perform under the name Willie DeVille instead of Willie would go on and have a 35 year career and actually create his own genre considered Spanish Americana of music. He re released a ton of albums and is considered to be pretty in influential. So a little history about the band. They were formed in 74 when members who was then called Billy Borse, Thomas Manfred Allen Jr. and bassist Ruben met on the San Francisco music scene. I love that there's all these people have so many different names. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> the first iteration of the band was called Billy D. Sade and the Marquettes. Remember, his name was Billy Borsé back then. In the band's own words, that they said they played mostly leather bars on Folsom Ave. So in 75, when he changed the name of the band from Mink DeVille, he changed his name from Billy Borsé to Willie DeVille. In that same year, they tried out and were named one of the original house bands at the club CBGB. Now, they weren't getting paid nothing. They were getting paid 50 bucks a night at the time. Like, late 70s, CBGB was just, that was the beginning of the punk scene. And so, and that's why them, Willie DeVille being a house band there, is kind of odd because he was more soul and R&B music than punk. He would also get married at the time to... I kid you not. Toots DeVille. <laughs> Toots, by the way, her and Willie were known for excessive drug use and outlandish behavior. Toots, apparently very jealous type. She was known for pulling knives on women who would flirt with Willie. I can't um, believe you would say such bad things about a woman named Toots. <laughs> Toots. She's got a Tootsie down a little bit. <laughs> 
after being a house band there, he'd go on to have a solo career. And even though the commercial success kind of waxed and waned over the years, he left a legacy as a songwriter, and he's known for influencing a crap ton of artists. All right, our last artist is Public Enemy. You gotta get yours. And Public Enemy, obviously the uh, infamous hip-hop group, from the 90s, featured members Chuck D, Flavor Flav, Professor Griff, Kari Wynn, DJ Lord, Sammy Sam, and S1W Group. No, I am not going to name everyone in S1W Group. <laughs> There's like 30 of them. Other members have included Terminator X, Sister Soldier, and DJ Juice. Before you get too far into it, John, I will say one of my favorite concerts I've ever been to and one of the biggest memories I have of one of the biggest bands I've ever seen is I've seen I saw a public enemy perform on the Smoking Grooves tour and they closed out the show. They came on stage after Cypress Hill. So that was an amazing set. Oh, wow. Public Enemy was formed in Long Island, New York in 1986. They are known for their politically charged music and for helping usher it in the golden age of hip-hop, which I don't think you would argue. They are up there with artists like Run DMC and NWA as far as like the forefathers of hip-hop. Absolutely. Yeah. Their first four albums in the late 80s and early 90s were all certified gold or platinum. But let's get back to the start. In the beginning, in uh, about 1986, Carlton Reidenauer and William Drayton met at <laughs> Long Island's prestigious Adelphi University. While developing their talents as MCs, Carlton was also delivering furniture for his dad's furniture business. He would form his first group. Chuck D and Spectrum City. They would release the album Check Out the Radio, follow that up but with an album Lies. Neither album was particularly big, but at the time, Chuck D was also working part-time at a radio station, and he was able to get his song Public Enemy Number 1 to get on the radio to get some regular play. I guess apparently he was beefing with some of the rappers in the area. So, like, they played that song, and it kind of worked out that the former... Uh, program director at that radio station he worked at he was hired by Def Jam during that time to help a struggling producer named Rick Rubin and he helped Rick mm. Rubin sign Chuck D wow yeah like that's a, that's a seriously big name to just come out of nowhere and to be the guy like Rick Rubin broke out with Chuck D and Public Enemy, who would form after that. So Carlton Reidenauer is Chuck D. He would bring along the Spectrum City, and that's also when they would bring on Professor Griff and Flavor Flav, who was already work, who was already who was William Dryden, who was already working with them. So believe it or not, their very first thing that they did was they started out as an opening act for the Beastie Boys during their uh -huh. License to Ill tour. Uh -huh. And then in 1987, they released their debut album under Public Enemy called Yo! Bum Rush the Show. Their first album would be released to critical acclaim. Their second album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back in 88, would include hits Don't Believe the Hype and Bring the Noise. Their third album... Fear of a Black Planet, released in 90, would be their most successful album. Guys, pretty big deal. That album, in 2005, was selected for preservation by the Library of Congress. Damn. It features hits like Fight the Power, is like an anthem, was like an anthem, still is like an anthem in hip-hop, and was the theme to Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Like I said, their first four albums were gold or platinum immediately, so they immediately saw success. 1994, Terminator X, a.k.a. Norman Rogers, would get in a motorcycle accident and shatter his left leg. He would relocate to a 15, his 15-acre ranch in North Carolina, and eventually he would start stop touring more and, and eventually retire in 1998. So in 98, he was replaced by DJ Lord, a.k.a. Lord Aswad. <laughs> yes, you heard that correctly. <laughs> Lord A-S-W-O-D. Public Enemy never actually broke up. They released their 13th album, July 2015. Around, and they've also started, Chuck D has been working on a PE 2.0 project standing for Public Enemy 2.0 with Oakland rapper Jahi, who he has said is his 
going to be a spiritual successor. They met at a performance at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999. And I think what that's about is I think they were insanely popular throughout the 90s. Like by the time the 2000s came, they didn't have to tour as much. They didn't have to do as much. About that time, Flavor Flav, uh, and I mean Flavor, I could, if I wanted to go in depth into Chuck D or just Flavor Flav, I could do a whole segment on just Flavor Flav or just Chuck <laughs> D. Let's put it this way. Flavor Flav did 90 days in jail for attempted murder for shooting a gun at his neighbor. Like, And that's just one of many stories. It was about the 2000s. Flavor Flav was starting to struggle with drug addiction. He got clean, did Flavor of Love and a series of reality shows, as well as having a relationship with Brigitte Nielsen, which was weird in its own right. And while he was doing that, Chuck D was actually still has was still releasing stuff with Public Enemy. But I think the idea of Public Enemy 2.0 was Chuck D kind of saying like, I'm going to step back, but you guys can keep touring under the Public Enemy name. Chuck D has been grooming other uh, rappers, and he he still thinks it's very important that rappers be political, and that he's afraid of like what happens to rap if that's not a part of it. And he's not alone in that. But I did hear him in an interview that he did the Combat Jack show, God Bless the Dead, Combat Jack, where he was talk. He talked about that, and he talked about how important it is, and he's not the only one that's that that's that way. KRS One was a very political rapper in his time is still that way still very important him grooming rappers to do that and there was so many yeah. of them from that generation that did that that's so important like a tribe called quest boogie down productions like the, there's so many yeah. political rappers from that era chuck d is just a historical figure out of all of the guys in public enemy like if you're making a mount rushmore chuck d's the guy in the group that's getting put up there in my opinion absolutely and they were inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame rightfully so in 2013 and aside from some of the craziness with flavor in the 2000s with his reality show stuff and i mean for the most part they never broke up they still exist they can they can they'll they still drop albums and they'll still go on tours when they feel like it when i usually do this with these big name groups it goes one of two ways either it's full of drug addiction and car crashes and and band members being replaced or it it reads like they're winning a lifetime achievement award or something and that's kind of what their biography reads like they were huge they were super popular but there's nothing like there were no riots it shows like there was controversy over the topics in their music and the in the lyrics but there was never anything like some of these bands where it's like they were too stoned to go on stage or stuff like that like they've They've been enormously successful and everything is just kind of, and they've continued to be successful for years. We're looking at you, Guns N' Roses. (laughs) I knew Public Enemy was going to be full of stuff. Yeah. Just didn't see Asphalt coming. (laughs) (laughs) Like John mentioned, we could go on and on and on and on and on about Public Enemy, but we got to go give our final thoughts about this week's episode. Um, And we got to get ready for free fall. So this is, this is basically free fall part one. Yeah. (laughs) Let's go. Give our final thoughts. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. We only have a few more weeks left. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to show your support. We would love to see your support in these final few weeks before we officially retire from the Go With The Heat podcast at Miami Vice. So go to that website, click on Contact Us, see all the ways that you can get a hold of us. You know that you can get us on Twitter, at Go With The Heat, Instagram, at Go With The Heat, Facebook, at Go With The Heat. You know where we're at. You can get a hold of us. You can go to your podcast, your platform of choice, leave us a review. You can email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Hell, next week, I might even say that we have a phone number. It might be something like 1-899-GO-WITH-THE-HEAT. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.